Hello. Welcome again to the Hello Rob class. I'm Professor Chad Jenkins of the University of Michigan. Welcome back. Uh, and as we take this great journey into robotics and start to do take our next step uh, to represent laser range data as uh, as C++ vectors, and this is just a little introduction into those C++ vectors. Um, and so I'm and um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'll just talk a little bit about what robots do. Uh, so, so in the class right now, what we're doing is we're going to get a robot to do wall following. So a robot is, has to stay a, a set distance away from the nearest object or, or the wall and basically move towards the wall as well as move along the wall. And so we can get a robot to do this, this nice little task here. And so we're moving up to that, but in order to do this, we need vectors. And so we have to be able to represent laser range data that we get off the robot um, and represent that computationally as a vector. That is a critical thing that we do in C++. And so, um, so what we, so, so the core device that we use that's spinning on top of the robot is a laser range finder uh, or a LIDAR device. And so the data that we get off of the LIDAR will be represented in C++ vectors. And so this is how we're going to, how we're going to, to access, to store access and, uh, and utilize this data. So just as a quick refresher, uh, laser scan data. So let's say our robot is sitting here um, and is, um, and is in some sort of uh, in some sort of area. So imagine that those are the obstacles, those are the walls in the area right now. Uh, what a laser rangefinder does is it basically sends light, laser light, in different directions, and that laser light goes off and hits something and comes back and tells us how far that laser has gone. And so we bit from that we we both get the distance that that light has traveled, so the distance to the object, but also the direction. We have to send that laser light out in a particular direction, and so we have that angular data there. And so both the ang those ranges and the angles will be stored in respective C++ vectors. So we'll have a range vector in C++ and an angle vector in C++ as well. But once we have that data, uh, then what we can do, and you'll do this as part of the project, is you will find um, the minimum ray inside of that vector, the smallest value uh, inside that C++ vector, and then that will tell that essentially we can use that both the range and angle of that data in order to convert it from polar car coordinates to Cartesian coordinates, which effectively means we'll get a vector. We'll get a geometric vector, not a C++ vector, a geometric vector to uh, for the robot that is the direction to the nearest object from the robot. And we'll use that for the robot to get closer as well as compute the distance, uh, compute the direction along the wall as well. And we'll, we'll sum those together and that will be the actual control command that we send to the robot. Um, the reason why we, you know, I mean, do you have to use C++ vectors? I guess you don't, but that's not really a great idea. You could use individual vector, you could use individual variables, um, but that's not really a good idea. We have this notion in computing of something called a data structure. A data structure is basically organizes how uh, how a computer program stores and retrieves data, and it does it in a more organized manner. And so it's not, you know, so so we put, could potentially just use individual variables for everything that we do, um, but that's not, you know, but that will make our programs very cumbersome, very difficult to write because individual variables that we would have, uh, you know, alone. Uh, are, are 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 not are, are usually very uh, very difficult to to write programs with because those individuals alone uh, or vectors give us the capability of 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 considering large amount of data and then representing in a way that we can we can access it we can retrieve it and, and store it in a more structured way so an individual variable is not big enough to deal with all the types of data that we that we might need so it, so as data grows we need our vectors to grow with that. Later on in the semester, we'll talk about structs. And so structs um, basically is when our data is not necessarily organized enough. So if we need to consider, uh, we need to consider data structures where we have various types of data and we have to bring it together into a particular organization that makes logical sense. So we can create new type, new data types. That's what structs will do for us. But we're really going to, in this lecture, talk about, uh, talk about, talk about vectors. That's going to be this lecture. And we'll talk about structs later as we go along in the course, particularly when we talk about uh, autonomous pathfinding. But for now, uh, let's think about vectors. And so one thing, one sort of, uh, some sort of healthy sort of analogy that I can, I can think of is thinking about, uh, thinking about like, let's say a parking structure as a, as a C++ vector. 
So how would I represent a parking structure as a C++ vector? And so I found this very interesting parking structure online. So this is a this is this is essentially a smart parking structure that allows you to only use two spaces on the ground to store 10 uh, or to, to store any number of cars. In this, this case, I think, uh, was that 10, 10 cars, 12 cars, something like that. I can't, I can't talk and look at that at the same time. That's just that's one of my, one of my, one of my quirks, I guess. But, uh, but we can store multiple cars using this, this sort of more vectorized data structure. And so, you know, so let's take a look at this from the, from the side view. And so this is that same data structure, just diagram, diagram, diagramically, uh, it's shown as a, in a, in a, in this diagram from the side view. And so in this type of parking structure, we can consider uh, a, a parking spot to be like a variable. A parking, a parking spot is a, is a place where we can store a, a vehicle. And so let's consider this sort of hypothetical data type of motor vehicle. That doesn't actually exist, but let's say a parking spot is a variable that allows us to store a particular vehicle. And so I can always make an assignment and just say my variable, my my parking spot as as this variable can store my can store my my car, and we use single individual parking spots all the time. So um so so back at at my house and when my when my son was a little guy, he's a big guy now, but uh, but uh, <laughs> we had this is where we parked our our minivan, and so we had one parking spot, and so we could store that car there. If you go to the auto show, they have a parking spot specifically for a particular particular sort of luxury vehicle that they want to show off. And so that's sort of a showcase spot. Um, this is just uh, somebody in my neighborhood who's who's parking, uh, who, you know, finds an individual parking spot on the on the street. Um, and then if you start to think about like you go out to the beach and, you know, people can park anywhere. There's no structure to it. You can just park wherever you want. And so, you know, so that that can be. Uh, I guess convenient in some some regards for individual spots because everybody's just putting cars everywhere, but that could lead to some disorganization and and you maybe you're not using your space efficiently or it can be inconvenient. Um, it doesn't scale very well, so that's why um, oftentimes when we, when we make parking structures, uh, we actually think about an organization to it that allows us to make efficiently use not just efficiently use our space, but gives us a logical way, uh, a, a organized way to access that space, so you know where things are. There's a reason why our parking spaces, our our parking lots, are in nice rows. Uh, you know where to park your car; it's guided in there. And, um, and, you know, in Michigan, we have, this is the division street lot at Michigan allows us to, to make uh, effective use of that space. Um, just noting to the side, uh, that little diagram that I had at the beginning, I, I, you should ask yourself, uh, you know, what, what, what's the number underneath that car and that, that, uh, that, uh, <laughs> in that little diagram, a little puzzle for you to think about as, uh, as we go along here. But really, this uh, you know, parking lots provide organization to our data, and oftentimes you can think of these as sort of like vectors. So a vector is a sequence of elements. So the same way our parking lot has, you may have numbers on your on your on your parking lot, and they might be in a nice row. Our vector can be can be seen as a, as a similar thing. Um, and so this vector stores a sequence of elements, like our sequence of cars, and it's considered an abstract data type. So every element in the vector has to be of the same type and we can store multiple of them. And so it's an abstraction on top of the notion of a variable. And so if we think about our smart parking structure in this way, it's able to, uh, it's able to, to, to store things in the sort of vectorized representation. So we can kind of think about all the, each individual car in this parking structure, this part, smart parking structure as being, uh, as being an element in our vector. As I sort of said before, a vector stores a sequence of elements. All of these elements, uh, all elements of this vector or any vector in C++ have to be of the same data type. So you can't have differing, differing data types. I can't store a vector, at least in C++, I can't store a vector that has, has a character in one element and, a, and an integer in another and a floating point number. They all have to be the same type. So in this case, in my abstract example, everything has to be a motor vehicle. I'm not going to store, you know, as a person, you can't be in there. You know, maybe we'll say we can't store motorcycles in there. You know, it has to be has to be a car of some form. Um, every element of a vector has an index. That's how we can refer into this vector. So we think of the car that we can first get out. Um, as we start off as zero. So that that's our, our zeroth element. So that's the first element in our in our vector. Note 
the first element is not one, it's zero. We start indexing from zero. And then the next element, the second element of our vector can be vector, uh, can be in, in, stored at index one. The third element is stored at index two. And if we keep going from there, we can um, we can we can index all the way to the to the size of the of the vector. So given that we know that, if we think of uh, of this vector, this vector will be represented uh, in 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 our program as a as a variable itself. It's sort of as an abstracted variable. Um, how do we use that vector to refer to, let's say, uh, say this car at uh, right here? Uh, the sixth element of this of this vector. Well, if we think about let's let's consider our vector to, to be um, to be named uh, to be named parking. We'll give it that variable name, and that's different than the actual physical parking system itself. So those are two separate things. The parking is is our vector representation, how we're how we're representing things in C plus plus. The parking system may be an actual physical structure that we're keeping track of. And once we have that vector, we can index into it to refer to a specific element. So we're going to use brackets. So if we say parking as the name of the vector, then in brackets, we say five, that five as the index into the vector, that will refer to the sixth element of the vector, which we which uh, which we're pointing to right here in this uh, in, in this image. And so the brackets around or uh, um, are allow us to index inside of this vector. We should note that C++ vectors uh, can grow and shrink as the number of elements increases or decreases. So in this case, we had a number of, we had a, we had a vector of this size to represent a parking structure that looks like this, but let's say we extended the parking structure to do, uh, to, to accommodate more cars. Well, we can similarly grow our C++ vector to do this as well. And we can, we can keep growing all the way, all the way out to whatever number number of cars we'd like to be able to to store, and we can shrink it if we have to, if as we um, as we remove spaces from our from our, our our smart parking structure. And so this is just giving some insight into what uh, what a vector representation looks like in C But let's do something I think maybe maybe more fun. Um, and so let's think about uh, let's let's think about what this is can you if so i'm just gonna i'm gonna just ask people to think about this so what what is this um just a little animation right here i have fun watching it take a little coffee while you're watching it all right so this is actually a uh, a golden spiral. So this is uh so so golden spiral creates this nice uh this nice spiral structure and you can, and and the golden spiral is based off of the golden ratio and and all these great things that appear in nature and actually are used to to do a number of things across across engineering. You know, I I personally like it because the golden spiral actually tells you where you should focus your your uh your camera when you're taking a picture. Uh, to to get to to make it look best, it, it's just sort of a nice photography sort of guideline. But this golden spiral is basically given to us by by what we by a sequence of Fibonacci numbers, and so Fibonacci numbers are something we could write a quick program to generate. So let maybe we should try that. Maybe we should um we should just write just a simple Fibonacci number generator. And so noting that the Fibonacci numbers, um, what they really represent is the area of each of each square uh, as we make a, a as we make a um, as we make a golden spiral. So we can start here at the at the beginning here. I'm going to do a little annotation right here. Um, yeah, we'll use that. So um, so our Fibonacci spiral starts right here at the end of, at at uh, at at this uh, at this uh, at this little um, at that, uh, at that vertex. And then we make a box of, of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, of area one, one unit length. And that gives us the next element, the next, uh, the next node that our curve has to go through. So we have this nice curve. Then our, then the next element of the sequence is going to be a one. And that creates this, this, uh, element right here at the edge of this box. Then, uh, then we're going to add. Uh, we're going to then then our next number in the Fibonacci sequence is going to be a two, which is going to be uh, which is going to give us this vertex. The next one is going to be three, then five for this square, then eight. Thirteen is going to be up here, 
and then 21 is all the way down there. Hopefully you can see it. And we can keep going as far as we want to, noting that the, the key relationship here is that whenever I want to generate the next number of the Fibonacci sequence, it's going to be the addition of the previous two numbers. So note that one and one here is equal to two. Two and one is equal to three. Two and three is equal to five. Uh, three and five is equal to eight and so on. And we go from there. So, um, so let me just clear that off. And so now if we, if we keep going from there, uh, we're going to then generate this Fibonacci sequence and represent it as a, I'm going to show what it looks like in terms of a state machine that we can then code up. I'm going to start by noting that our Fibonacci sequence starts with, with two numbers, zero and one. So we, kn we know that ahead of time, we don't have to compute that. And so the zero starts for, for a, a square of, of zero area plus our first square, which is, which is area, area one. I'm going to create a vector called fib nums, fib underscore nums. I just, you know, just made that num name. I could call it whatever I wanted to. And when I create that vector, that vector starts as, as empty. There's nothing inside of that vector. Um, what I'll first do is, is push my first number on. So uh, onto this, onto this vector. So pushing will add an element to the end of the end of the vector. And so I will add my first element zero of that. And so then I will push onto the end of this vector again, another element that's gonna be, that's gonna have the value one that's gonna represent our, our two Fibonacci, our first two Fibonacci numbers. So the next thing I should do is take those two numbers and then add them together. So I'm gonna add, so the next step is I'm gonna take those two numbers at the, at the previous, at the, at the current low, at the, at the previous two locations add them together. That gives me a new value, which I'm going to put in this variable called current fib num. And I'm going to add those together. And then I'm going to push that value onto the end of my vector. And so now I've completed the first three Fibonacci numbers. So I want to compute the next one. I will take the my two, my 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 current Fibonacci number and the previous one, add those together. And that gives me uh that gives me two, which I'm storing in this this variable current fibnum, and then I will push that value onto the end of my, onto the end of my, um, uh, end of my vector of fibnums. I will continue to do this again. So add one and two together. So my current two, my, my previous two Fibonacci numbers, add them together, store it, push the result onto the end of my, uh, onto the end of my, my vector. We'll do this again. We add, we add two and three together push the result back onto the, onto the end, add three and five together, push the result onto the end, add five and eight together, push the result onto the end of the vector. I may want to stop at some point. So, so for my state machine here, I'll say if the result that I compute is greater than, let's say 17, then, uh, then, then I want my program to stop and I want to end program. And, uh, and so I could do that. Um, and so if I, if I added that to my state machine, then in my next iteration of going through this loop, I will compute 21 and that will be what my Fibonacci numbers look like. So I will have a vector that looks like this at the end of computing my, my Fibonacci numbers. And so that's great to see what it looks like from a, from a, you know, as the process for generating these numbers, let's look at some code to see what this actually, what this, this actually looks like. So we're going to do it through a, so we'll just do the, an example of, uh, of, uh, of creating a Fibonacci number generator, which I created in Replit right here. And so you can see the result of that. Um, and so, so noting that I, uh, I graded this, I, you know, that's my name. I put, put just, you know, the title of this, so I know what it is an author. So if somebody looks at it, they know it's me that's right. And I put a license on it, uh, the Michigan honor license, because that's what I do. Um, you'll note that at the beginning of our of our file here, not only do we include IO stream, which is going to give us, which is an include that gives us um, a C plus plus include that gives us that has gives us the ability to uh, to interact with the console, output numbers through the console, as well as get in for, get get uh, input back from um, from the user. We're also including uh, 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 the C plus plus vector library, which now allows us to to represent vector vector data types and so that we if, if we do that include vector then we can um we can write a declaration for a vector variable 
that um, in this case will include elements of type int. So if I say std colon colon vector, that says that I'm creating a, a vector variable uh, inside of the the greater than uh, less the less than and greater than sign is is the type of the of 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 each element. So these will be integer elements, and um, and then I give the the name of the of the uh, of the of the um of the vector variable itself, which I'm calling fibnums as we did before. And note that a vector be, can, can be created for any defined data type. So it could be with floats or char or booleans or um or you know if you want to get fancy another vector itself which is which uh which gets super fancy but we're not going there yet. Um and so we're just gonna we're just gonna deal with these integers right right here. So if I go into Replit, I can then, uh, if I hit the run button, it will compile my program, my C++ program, and then it will it will run the, it will execute the program. And then when my program's running at the beginning of my, of, of my program running, we'll have, uh, we'll, our declared variables will then, uh, will then be uh, available in memory. And so I create, so these, these variables are essentially the vector of fibnums. Uh, Fibonacci numbers as fib, fib nums, uh, our current Fibonacci number, which which I use that as a variable for storing things, and then variable i, which is an integer, integer um, that is going to be uh, that is going to we're going to use for doing loop iterations. Note all of our Fibonacci numbers will be integers, so that's why I chose an integer data type as opposed to float uh, or something like that. When we start with our first, uh, so our first executable statement. So once we've done all the, that, our first ex executable statement uh, will be will be right here, which is going to be um, fibnums pushback fibnums dot pushback zero. What does that mean? What is that doing? Well, when I have a, with, when I have a, a vector, so I have any sort of vector. If I say dot pushback, that is a that is a a function that's provided by the vector that will push uh, a value to the end of, uh, will create a new element at the end of the of the vector and store the value, uh, a given value that's given as a function parameter in that uh, in that element. So pushback, again, adds an element to the back and stores that stores in that element a value that's that's val right here. So in the case of uh, in the case of our our our, our line here, line nineteen, um, what that what that's doing is saying fibnum fibnums dot pushback zero. So that's saying store onto fibnums, create a new element at the end of the vector fibnums, and in in that vector store the value zero. And so if we execute that line, then a zero will will get an element of zero that will appear on our in our um in our uh, in our vector fibnums. If I move down and then uh, and then at the, my next line, then I will that I will that will essentially push another element on a new element, a second element that will be uh, that will have the value one. Then I'm going to move down to my for loop, and so my for loop is going to start from the second element of the of the uh, of 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 fibnums. That's where we're going to start from one, and so our iterator value will start from one. And what we're going to do is try to compute the third number of the Fibonacci sequence. And so in order to do that, we should note that what you're seeing here is that you're going to say that the third, that we're going to store into this variable fibnum, the current, I mean, the, the, the current variable, uh, current fibnum is going to be fibnums i plus fibnums minus uh, index i minus one. And so what this is saying is that let's take the current, the fibnum and the current index. So fibnums i is going to is, since i is really it has the value one right now, um, fibnums i is going to say uh, is going to refer to the second element of the of the vector uh, fibnums that has uh, with with as with index one note uh, second element is at index one, and that will be uh, that will be the that will be the that will have the value that is currently storing the value of one. In general, for any vector that we have in C++, uh, if we say vector bracket i, that will refer to the ith element of of, C, of a C++ vector. We can also do uh, we can also do operations on that index. So if we say fibnums i minus one, because i is really is right now it takes on the value one. Um, fibnums i minus one will look will look at fibnums zero. And what's stored in that index in, into fibnum zero is going to be is going to have the value zero. We take those two values together, one plus zero, 
and we add and that will be stored in the current uh in, into fibnum and that is the that is uh that will be one and so we store that and then we can take that variable we can say we can we don't have to just give us a, a constant value we can give the current value of a of a um of a uh of a variable so current fib so current underscore fib dot uh, underscore num is value one uh and that will essentially create a new element at the end of our of our of our fib nums which will be the second uh, which will be the third um uh ele third fibonacci number in sequence um and so note that pushback is going to be passing this by value so so it won't so so it doesn't take on sort of uh it won't affect, it won't change that value of that variable. It will only copy it. Once we get through this, we've gone through our first iteration of the loop. Uh, and then we're going to come back up and then we'll do our next iteration. Note that in our second iteration through this loop, I will update from, we will increment by one due to I plus plus. And that will, um, that will, uh, that will make our value of I now become two. So now through the second iteration of the loop, we come down um, so now I is equal to two. We can index into fib nums two, which is going to be equal to one. We can index into fib nums I minus one, which will be fib nums one. And that will be, that will, that will be one as well. Look, I, I put little index indices on the, on the fib nums, uh, 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 vector. So you can see what that looks like. We add those together and we will get the value two and that will be stored. And that will be, that value will now be stored in current fib num, we take that value and we push it onto the end of our vector. Then we have uh, then we have a new element for that vector, and then we finish this loop. If we continue and go again, our next iteration through the loop, i is going to be equal to three. We do our we compute our next Fibonacci number. So looking at at fib nums at the current index i and fib nums at the current index i minus one index minus one and that looking at that value. And so now if we look at both of those, we'll get a two, a value two and a value one. We'll add those together. And then FibNum will be updated to three. And then we ascend, then we push that onto the end of our vector. And then that gives us the fifth Fibonacci number. We'll end our loop and come back up. Now for iteration where I is equal to one, We'll get new Fibonacci numbers. So at uh, so that we'll take the fifth Fibonacci number, add it to the fourth Fibonacci number, which will now give us a value for five. And then we're going to store that five, push it onto the end of the vector, finish our loop, and come back up. Now our our end our our in, our iterator come uh in, iterator advances. And we keep going from there. I may have made a mistake with the iterator right there and didn't have a six there, but uh, but I'm good for for seven. And then we go all the way to eight. Now we can now eight represents our iterator i for for eight represents our our uh, our um our ninth Fibonacci number. We push it to the end. And note, I didn't necessarily say in my previous version. I said, uh, you know, when we did the state machine, I said if the result is greater than than um than um than 17. But in this case, I knew I only want to generate the first nine Fibonacci numbers. So I said, as long as in my for loop, I said as long as I stays less than eight, then we're going to continue. But now I is no longer less than eight. So now our for loop is going to stop, is is not going to execute anymore. We won't iterate to the for loop again. And then we will come back down uh, and we will exit the loop. And now we will print each of these these numbers. So now I have a, a print that's going to say printing the first nine Fibonacci numbers. One thing that you should note is we have an interesting thing about the vector in this case, where we have uh, this. It pro so vectors also can tell you how big they are. They can tell you their current size. So if you take a C++ vector and you use its function that's provided, that's called uh, a size. So vector dot size, you call that, that will return an integer that is the current number of elements inside of that vector. That's the size variable. And so in this case, we've computed nine Fibonacci numbers. And so uh, so that's we, where we have, uh, that's where nine will show up. Note our highest index here is eight because we're indexing starting from zero. That eight will, that if we have, if our last index is eight, we, that means we have nine elements in our vector. 
So if we continue on, then if we go inside of this for loop and we and we start executing starting from i equals zero all the way to the to the to while we're while our our iterator variable stays less than the than the size, uh, we will go through and we will print out uh, zero and one for the second Fibonacci number. We'll continue to go through this three, four, five. Um, and we will go all the way through. Oops. All right. A little synchronization as you hear, but you see the process, right? And then once we then we once we printed all of those out, and we've we and now our iterator variable, which is now nine, because we've come through that through printing out our our, our iteration. Now nine is greater than the number of is no longer less. Our iterator i is no longer less than the size of the of the of the vector, which is also nine. And so now we're going to execute this this for loop, and then we'll print done. And at that point, we can then end program. And our variables go away because our program is no longer running anymore, but we've output the right thing and we've, we, uh, we have our Fibonacci numbers. Before I go, I want to, you know, just say like, you know, like here, maybe there's something else that we can do too. I like printing uh, Fibonacci numbers in reverse order. So I just want to show one more capability of vectors or maybe a few more capabilities of vectors that will allow us to present uh, just one way to, pr to print Fibonacci numbers in reverse order. So I took that same code that we had before and we added a, I added a code segment. So this area that I added right here just added that code segment. And that essentially is going to pr print my Fibonacci numbers in, in the reverse order. So if I execute everything that I did like I, like I, like I did before, and I got all the way and I executed my code all the way up to, to line 27. So I've computed all my Fibonacci numbers. And now I want to just output them in reverse order. What I can do is I can, I'll, I'll just, I'll first print out that I'm going to I'm just say to the user, I'm going to, or out to the console, I'm printing my first nine Fibonacci numbers in reverse order. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, while my, my vector is not empty, continue doing this while loop. And so uh, just so, so you know what that means. So a vector has the capability of saying um, it has a, provides a function as well that will return a Boolean that tells you whether it has no elements in it or not. So true if, if, the, vec if the vector has no elements or is, is empty um, and false otherwise. So as long as my vector is not empty, so know that I have an exclamation point at the end, I'm going to continue running this loop. And what that loop is going to do is it's going to output the current element in the back of the, at, at, at the end of the vector and then remove that element. And the way I do that is I first use, uh, I come down to line 33 and I use the vector back function. So but ve what vector back does is it will give, it will return the value of the element that is stored in the last element of the C++ vector. So in, in, in the case of my, my fib nums dot back, what you'll see is that's the last element is, is storing the value 21. And so that value will be returned. I'm going to store that into current fib num. That doesn't change the value of fib num, but trust me, it's going to get stored there. And then I will output that value to the con to the to the terminal to the console. And then I want to remove that element from my um from my vector. And so I will use uh, I will use the function that's provided called pop back. And so pop back will remove the last element from a C vector. So once I do that, uh, the last element at index eight which storing 21 will go away. I come to the end of my 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 vec uh, my loop, then I'll come back up and my my um my vector fib nums is, is still this still has elements, it's not empty. So I will come down and I will store the current value of fib nums at that's in back. So it's storing 13. And so we'll store 13 in 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 uh in as, as current fib num. We will output that to the console. And then we will remove that element from the back um, by using uh, by using pop back, which will take that element away. And then that will end my in this uh, this iteration of loop. I will come back up, and now my my vector is still not empty, but I will go and look at what's at the end of it, which is an eight. I will store that val value, output it to the to the console, remove that element. 
and continue. And without going through each each iteration again, so I'm just going to I'm just going to go through um, I'm just going to just going to go over the loop without stepping through it. Um, you know, if we continue to run this iter iteration over and over, we'll remove the five and output it. We'll remove the three and output it. We'll remove the two and output it. We'll remove the the one and output it. The the we'll, we'll, and that second one, that first one, which is the first, the second element of our Fibonacci sequence, and then um, and then we'll output the zero. So now I've output all those in reverse order. Now my vector is empty, and so uh, so now this this condition, uh, the now no, my while loop condition is no longer true. So I will exit that loop. And then I'm I can print done. So I'm done. Note I didn't take out this code before that will um that uh, that is also printing the the Fibonacci numbers in forward order. Um, but note my vector is empty right now. So 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 if I if I run this line here, I'm gonna get no Fibonacci numbers because there's nothing there's none left. And so uh, so what's gonna happen is I will just jump over this this uh, this for loop because size will be zero at, at this point. So there's no iterations to run. And then I'm done and I will end program. And so if you think back to all the things that we've covered in, in, uh, in, this, in this lecture, we've talked about all the features that C++ vectors have. Um, we've used it in the simple case of the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and so you have what you need now to, to, to be able to access and use uh, laser range data from the robot. And uh, as well as use C plus C vectors for anything that you may you may uh, you may you may find you need to represent. And so, thank you very much for your attention and listening, and uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing your robots follow walls and do all sorts of amazing things. <laughs>